welcome to our guest speaker, Professor <coughs> Lee Min. Uh, before I introduce Professor Lee, I would like to announce the upcoming spring events of the Tang Center. In a couple of weeks, uh, March 8, to be exact, UC Berkeley postdoctoral scholar who's sitting almost in the back row, uh, Jack Chia, will speak on uh, 18th and 19th century Buddhism in the South China Sea. Uh, on May 4th and 5th, Friday, Saturday, we have organized an international conference on ancient and medieval Indian Ocean trade. The conference is the culmination of a year-long focus on the maritime Silk Roads. Uh, we invite all of you to join us uh, on that weekend. Uh, more information is available on our website. Uh, just Google Berkeley, uh, I was going to say Tang Center, but that's not a good idea because we also have a health Tang Center. So better to Google Berkeley Center for Silk Road Studies and that will get you to our, our website. So to our speaker then. Uh, Professor Lee obtained his PhD in anthropology from the University of Michigan and is Associate Professor of East Asian Archaeology at UCLA. He has a dual appointment in Asian Languages and Cultures and Anthropology respectively. Professor Lee has two, uh, as I understand it, two main areas of interest. Uh, the first is prehistoric and Bronze Age China, and the second, the archaeology of Asiatic maritime trade, with particular focus on the production and distribution of ceramics in coastal China and Southeast Asia. His most recent work, entitled so Social Memory and State Formation in Early China, will be published in Mar March of this year by Cambridge University Press. Other books include, uh, in 2017, a co-authored volume entitled Landscape Archaeology at Khufu, Place Memory and Urban Foundation in Early China. Some recent articles include, in 2015, uh, characterization of early imperial lacquerware from the Luozhang, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, Han tomb, uh, China, and in 2013, fragments of globalization archaeological porcelain and the early colonial dynamics in the Philippines. Uh, from 2009 to 2015, he was the co-director of the Regional Archaeological Survey of the Kufu region in Shandong, China, a joint project between UCLA, the University of Michigan, Shandong Institute of Archaeology, and Shandong University. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, he currently serves as the co-director of the Wenshi River Basin Archaeological Survey project, uh, which is also a collaboration between UCLA and scholars in China. Today, Professor Li will provide some insights into the patterns of late medieval and early modern trade in his talk, Reconfiguration of Ceramic Production and Trade in China at the Threshold of Global Trade, an Archaeological Perspective. Please help me welcome Professor Li. It's a great pleasure to uh, visit UC Berkeley and speak of my research here. Uh, can we dim the light a little bit? Okay, okay. so uh, my research here uh, fits a broad idea of the Silk Road, although as you can see from the beginning image, is we trace the, the global trade of the, the Silk Road connections to place uh, stereotypical of what we will think about as Jiangnan. You know, this very lush environment of the lower Yangtze. So that's a significant deviation from what we know as the Silk Road in Central Asia, where we, UCLA, is just starting an initiative uh, to do archaeology and art um, in the Donghuang Oasis. This is the Jade Mine, dates to the third millennium BC. I just visited with the director of uh, the Terracotta Soldiers Excavation. Uh, and also our UCLA team uh, in December. So this, this, uh, the participation of archaeologists in this uh, collaborative team, including many artists and the museum curators, uh, help to anchor the understanding of the Silk Road dynamics in deep history. So we are looking at this early Bronze Age settlers going back to 5,000, 4,000 years ago. So those are actually uh, jade mining outcrops. The dark places are basalt uh, outcrop where they're making the stone tools. 
So here I'm looking at this most more recent episode of the connections. And it connects with our previous uh, speakers, especially in the work of uh, uh, Professor Sun, that is focusing on the pre-modern pre -modern world system. That's connections, has been fostered by 13th century trade and by the expansion and the conquest of the Mongolian Empire. And these can allow us to look at these global connections before the activities, the colonization and the global expansion of Europeans. And then the question would be, how does this Asianic world system, as has already developed since the Southern Song period, since the 13th century, significantly consolidated and expanded during the Mongolian Empire, how did that get transformed? into a modern world system that we know of and we live in. So this is a grand transformation that takes many centuries to develop. And most of us can uh, know that the inauguration of Manila Galleon, that the, tra the first trans-Pacific uh, fleet that connect the commodity markets from the Europe, the New World, and Asia, that is the first moment of globalization. So my interest is how does this change in the early 15, uh, sorry, early 1570s? How does that transform the Asianic trade that developed since the 13th century? And it's very interesting that this transition involves the very place we're standing on. So San Francisco, especially Drake's Bay, was part of this uh, Trans-Pacific Galleon route. And you have shipwrecks at Drake's Bay. And we'll talk about that. So the archaeology of this early global trade not only document the distribution, but the diverse ways that material culture articulated into the local life. Uh, some are direct, influenced directly by these encounters, and some are indirectly. Within this, I choose porcelain because it yields the first and the most extensive physical evidence for sustained cultural encounter on a global scale. And for even for the, I'm quoting the historian Finley, uh, even for the indications of genuinely global culture. And for most archaeologists, you know that porcelain has an advantage, is not destructible. So it's very easy to trace them. And just to put this research into context, if you compare this quote from Marco Polo and with Marx, and you can see there's a strong contrast. The contrast where Marx is looking at Asia as more static, and need a jump start from European feudalism, and compared to you know, Marco Polo's vision, there's something, it is very by kind of a polarizing view and we have to then use archaeology to find something in the middle. What exactly is going on in that period? And then for today's talk, what that transition is like, that important transition in the 17th century, where eventually it, it changed from Asian trade network to a global trade network. So um, just to build some connections, I'm reviewing some recent archaeological work uh, from the 13th to 14th century so that you can compare what's to come. And one very famous shipwreck is the Nanhai number one in Yangjiang. So this is a 13th century trade where a large volume of, you can see the very distinctive watertight compartment ship construction of China and has this massive produced trade wares. And it's very interesting to look at the way they are packed, think about the way they are mass produced, and then to think about this kind of technology, this kind of export configuration. How does that then transform with the arrival of new world silver? And the consequence changes all the way taking to the 19th century, including the Chinese migration to California. So this, this ceramic uh, production is a continuity, yet experience many transformations. We have to think about this long-term view. 
Again, in relation to Dr. Sen's work, we have during the Mongolian period, so this is the middle uh, 14th century, middle to late Yuan Dynasty, you have the most recent discovery in Taichang. So this is where the Zhenghe fleet eventually, eventually will leave China. During the Mongolian period, you already see this massive development uh, of trade, commercial stations, warehouses. So the recent excavations at this site, Fan Chunjing, uh, revealed 150 ton of ceramic ware, broken ware. So this shows the scale. It's already scale of trade and operation, both domestic and international, already during the period, this Mongolian period, before the Zhenghe fleet eventually take off, seal off here. So here are some of the fine examples from this 150 ton of ceramic material. And many of this would end up in Southeast Asia, in Korea, Japan, and the Indian Ocean world. Also these blue and white. Uh, the, these things are from uh, where from Fujian. It's not good looking, but it's, it's a good example that this technology, which is almost early imperial, it's so like Han Dynasty technology, but that kiln is so resilient they can manage to use this very old technology and to be operating from the Song Dynasty all the way to uh, late imperial era. So, and the, they then adapt to very dynamic, changing global circumstances. So once you see these things, you have to think about the scale of production, the scale of trade, and then that will trace us to, the, to that beautiful village I have shown you in the first slide. So that's Longquan. And it's in these regions that these dragon kilns would be 100 meter long going up the slope uh, that's pr mass producing these, uh, supply, uh, these uh, silidon wares. And the fine ones would use that stacked sager. And then the low quality ones will be produced in these stack firing. Okay, so these are one of the surviving dragon kilns. And that's how it was done at that time. And this particular technology has very deep roots. Okay, so this is a 3,000 year old uh, technology, going back to the early Bronze Age in that area. So we're looking at the long durée here, and against that long durée, we look at the transition toward the modern, the early modern era. So, but before we reach the Europeans, we still need a few steps. I will briefly look at what are the key questions in our field. One is the idea of an early Ming gap and the rise of overseas factories in Southeast Asia. And this is most elaborately developed, researched by late Dr. Rosanna Brown of UCLA. And this, this idea of an early Ming gap describes the period when the early Ming government shut down private trade. Okay, so the Zhenghe fleet falls into the early Ming gap. So it, as most of us know, the fleet is not aimed at promoting commercial trade. So in commercial market, that Ming gap is a lack. After 1368, the beginning of the Ming, the, there's a major shortage of Chinese export blue and white, uh, in the global market, in, in the Asianic market. And in order to fill in that void, many overseas factories in South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia flourished. But this idea has recently been challenged by scholars in China that argue that there is a domestic ban on consumption of polychrome wares too. So this is not only a restriction on the border, is also a domestic policy. So there's just generally lack of consumer access to blue and white. So it's not only uh, stopped at the border. Uh, so, but against this general broad ban, there are, the, the production during the Ming Dynasty, Ming Dynasty, early Ming Dynasty carried on, especially for the Zhenghe's order, diplomatic gifts, that's the recent discovery at the Fengdong Yan location at Longquan. So I will show you examples. So is that where 
These celadon wares produced very large insides, kind of a spinach in color, very distinctive color, uh, imperial motif. So these are the real Zhenghe pieces. And most of us who do archaeology would testify we have never seen it in overseas. Okay, So that shows the scale of the influence of that particular expedition. And then the mo main, next major breakthrough is around 14, so Zhenghe is early 1400s. And then around 1480s, that's middle Ming period, there is a sudden explosion of productions in Jingdezhen. And it flooded the, ex uh, the international market, blue and white, and basically reclaimed the market that was lost to the uh, overseas factories. So this is done in the Hongzhi period. So the interesting thing is if you look at the text, that's not the period that the maritime ban is restricted. It's still re reinforced, especially if you read the Korean scholar official's uh, memoir when his ship wrecked on China coast and then he was arrested and then taken all the way back to the capital and sent back to Korea. So he wrote a memoir, so Piao Hai Lu, Cui Bo. And the, the memoir described how, uh, how strict the maritime defense is, but it also described upon the first arrival of a naval officer, Ming naval officer approaching him, he asked him if there's a, he has any pepper, which means the officers taking him as a pirate. If he doesn't have, if he proves he's not a pirate, it doesn't have a good to trade, then they determine he is a pirate because you, then you can kill him and claim you have killed a pirate. So, so if it's a genuine pirate, they're going to deal. If it's, a, if it's a refugee, then better kill him and declare you have ambushed a pirate. So that shows the subtlety of that period. But in archaeological, archaeological record, you see this massive export of middle Ming material like Lena Shaw in uh, Philippines and many, many in um, Middle East. Some of those previously, when I was young, were mistakenly treated as Zhenghe's gift. Okay, so that's the problem, especially the one with a golden fish in the middle. So that's the Hongzhi revival. And during the late Ming period, you have the arrival of the Europeans. So you have the Portuguese in the uh, Indian Ocean, and they are not they're not much big, not a big player because they don't have the hard currency. Is the rival of the Spanish across the Pacific with American silver that really boosts the European buying power? Yet, with the restrictions sanctioned by the papal bull that they're not supposed to go into Eastern Hemisphere, so they stayed in Manila, not going further into the China coast. So Chinese and other traders has to come to them. So the major change in the late Ming period is the rise of the quack production in Jingdezhen. So this is primarily for export. I will show you how it look like. And the rise of Zhangzhou production on the coast uh, that was produced by these pirate hubs. So here is the Feng Dongyan material. So if you ever find a shipwreck that you would think would be associated with Zhenghe, you should have this on them, okay? And actually there are. I have saw survey material in South China Sea. Uh, no, no rack, only deposit of this. So some of these get dumped overboard or the rack itself has det deteriorated. So let's look at the early modern production sites. So here is the 16th. Now we're into the 16th century. Jingdezhen and Zhangzhou are the major production centers, and they have very different technology strategies. So Jingdezhen is focusing on high quality control, small volume, okay? And Zhangzhou, it, earlier you have seen that's massive production in Dragon Kiln. You see, this is not Dragon Kiln. Because Dragon Kiln, each firing could produce 100,000 pieces. Depending on the locations of these wares, the quality control may not be so ideal. But when you have these small kiln, you can control the temperature much better. So the success rate is very good. 
the jungle where, so the crackware looked like this, and they are everywhere, especially in um, Europe, you see in Dutch paintings. So they have these panels, and the important part of the global culture, but somehow the kilns hasn't been identified, which is very strange. In this massive city, we now have good evidence for imperial production. Now there's even these testing samples for exact, like Kangxi Emperor. So even you can be so specific about the ceramic production archaeology, yet this massive operation somehow still waiting for our discoveries. So here are only a few clues for where it could be, but you don't have in situ or massive deposit of these wasters. One explanation is probably their quality control is so good, they don't break the, the, the failure is not that high. And this material, so this is from Jindajin, so these are marketed to Japan. Many of them are still floating, so many of them are heirloom pieces in Japan, so it's a shaping Japanese culture. You, there, you can see Iranian uh, imitations, so that gave you an example of what it means to be a global culture, with the exception of China. These things don't find on Chinese archaeological sites with the exception of shipwrecks for exports and a few elite tombs that use weight, uh, reject pieces. You see there's a crack there as funerary goods. So this is a very interesting phenomena where I have argued is this flame buoyant looking material and the, their association with foreigners, okay, that pretty much fall into the category of the cultural other or the other world. So this would go, a lot, go well with these paper things that in Chinese funeral. So, so they, in Chinese elite perspective, they're not prestige goods. So these are part of the funerary furniture aimed for that extravagance. So, and then Zhangzhou. So Zhangzhou, most of us know, especially Yuegang, is the pirate hub and later dominated by uh, the Zheng family, uh, Nicholas and Kaosinga, uh, Zheng Chenggong. So their political history, especially dealings with Japanese and the Dutch are well known, but then we have to look at its economic basis. So they are certainly involved in trading those crackware from Jingdezhen to the Dutch but they also, this area also have production in these mountains around the port. And here they adopt very, it's kind of a compromised technology, okay, or refined technology. They want the volume, yet they also want the quality temperature control. So that's why you see these compartments. These compartments almost look like the compartment in the ship hall, right? So they allow that the temperature uh, to be fairly consistent within each compartment. Otherwise, if you have a long dragon kiln, the draft just goes through. So this way is aimed at large volume, yet good quality control for each of this compartment. And they made extensive use of these saggers. So these saggers are boxes, so the ashes don't fall on the glaze. And they have two production lines, well, three actually, uh, two production lines for blue and white. One is the traditional forms that evolve out of the middle Ming tradition, and then the imitation of the crackware with multiple panels. So that allows them to cater to a very diverse market, especially low end market. Um, the third is these silidon. The silidon, if you look at it, you would misjudge them as early Ming or even Mongolian ware. Okay, so this shows this kind of production has a longevity. It really need the archaeology really need to connect well with the kiln sites and shipwrecks to date them well, especially in a colonial con consumption context. And this involves careful observation of its uh, uh, technical attributes. Jingdezhen, for example, that's the Jingdezhen where this is Zhangzhou where. Uh, they would dip the glades and then shave the foot ring. So it's very clean. And here, 
they would turn in Zhangzhou, they would turn the plate and then they would pour the glaze over it and then put it on sand. So much sand gets stuck on it. So all of these things, uh, then uh, my PhD student have used this uh, uh, chemical composition to ana ana uh, analyze very small particles. The aim for this is to understand the different configurations in trade, especially in places like uh, Colonial Manila, to say what the Spaniards use, what the natives got. So the early modern shipwrecks, there are many, many of them. So I'm just going to quickly go through some of this underwater survey in South China Sea, showing you the extent of this Zhangzhou production. So this is the Zhangzhou production. And this, the discovery of the Zhangzhou ware is actually uh, traced back to University of Michigan. I will talk more about it. So here is the Manila galleon trade. So you go from Acapulco straight to Manila and then eventually finding the way back uh, following the, Japan, the Japanese current. So as on the way back, you would stop at San Francisco area. And the most interesting shipwreck is this uh, San Diego galleon, which sunk in Manila Bay, was ambushed by the Dutch. The interesting dynamic is here is you see Japanese mercenaries, you see native people, you see um, goods like ceramics that's coming in from the Peruvian direction. So it shows how cosmopolitan that these materials are. And uh, Dr. Alan Shea, co-advised by Professor Van Falkenhausen and myself, just got her PhD, had worked on this uh, Manila excavations. So it's here, these encounters, uh, one is the Captain Drake's uh, arrival in Drake's Bay, which has very much captured the Californian archaeology for much of the 20th century, yet still uh, cannot be proven on archaeological ground, is related to this episode. Okay, so whether he made it or not, whether he made it here or not, this idea of encounter it's very um, stereotypical and has been repeated elsewhere as described by anthropologist Marshall Solins. And then you have that shipwreck is for sure in uh, Drake's Bay. So two of these episodes would contribute to these personal wear excavated in the Miwok village at Drake's Bay, Point Reyes National Park. And previously, um, uh, Dr. V uh, Ed Vanderboden, so nov nov uh, nautical historian, has and his collaborator has used art historical attributes to try to distinguish these two episodes. Okay, and now I think only when we connect closely with the works at the kiln sites, we can have a possibility to distinguish something too so close within two decades. Okay. So that has to be ongoing. But nevertheless, these things are here. At least it should come from the second episode in the 1590s. And you can see the native Indians got hold of them and then they modified uh, modify them with their kind of cultural views based on shell. Because they don't have a ceramic tradition. They, they likely treated these as shells and then they make shell beads out of this. And similarly, uh, in the Baja area, um, Ed van der Bolden and his team is working on this shipwreck that spread seven kilometers on the coast of Baja Peninsula desert. Again, these native Indians would access these and use uh, flint napping techniques to try to modify them. Originally, we had some, at least from my personal perspective, I have some difficulty dating these things because these were dated using Captain Drake as a reference point. Yet that reference point cannot be established on archaeological ground. But now, with the participation of uh, Dr. Uh, Wen Yanjun, a postdoctoral scholar at uh, UCLA, who is a, will be a future leading archaeologist at Jingdezhen, we can start to connect these wares with the excavations in Jingdezhen. 
And he already studied these and argued that this Baja cargo is indeed very early, some days to 1560s, which means some of these cargo, probably old cargo, when the Manila galleon carried, the first Manila galleon carried them over to the New World and a sunk here. So they would have been sitting in Manila probably several decades. And it's also possible that some of these exploratory galleons, which has no record of them, didn't make it back and just stuck there. So this opens the kind of experimental stage, the possibility of a study, the trial and the failure in the moment of early global connection. And now let's look at the change in consumption side. This is the, the work I have done uh, in Philippines material that are very much owed to the founder of Michigan anthropology, Carl Guta, who took up the offer of some of the Michigan alumni who was uh, colonial officers in Manila, offered a government yacht and he excavated for three years, excavated 500 sites. So this is the largest archaeological operation in Philippines and produced 20,000 material remains uh, in our collection. And generations of uh, students has been working on this uh, from the perspective of Asianic trade. And my interest was how does Asian, how did this indigenous community, how did their access to these trade goods change after the colonization? Okay, so, so here are the, uh, colonial, the map of the early colonial fort. So what I did is I tried to look, uh, date them. It's a different time period. So that's the middle Ming I was talking about. So that's the Mongolian period. That's the late Ming. They all have different colors and different motifs. And I will look at the quantity change, the quality change, and the change in sources. Uh, basically, the quantity didn't change much. So late Ming is a booming time. It only declined after the 17th century, 18th century. Okay. I don't quite understand why. And the quality change is quite obvious. So during the Middle Ming period, is fairly homogeneous. Everything is about middle quality. But once you come to the late Ming period, you can see those fine wares are associated with colonial sites, Spanish colonial sites, where these uh, uh, coarse Zhangzhou productions can filter through to all these villages. Most of these islands he explored in southern Philippines probably have never seen a Spaniard. But their trade patterns, the configuration of their trade has been fundamentally changed with the arrival of Spanish silver. So that is a very important change and generally the quality. So the blue is uh, middle Ming period and then the purple is a late Ming period. So one, two, three, four, these are quality, um, my quality ranking, you can see uh, in the late Ming period, there's a lot more low quality pieces, okay? So uh, this is consistent with the Dutch textual narrative where these Zhangzhou ware and the Jing Dungeon ware are both on board, but they use, the Dutch would use the Zhangzhou ware to trade with the indigenous population for supplies and other goods. So by the time their fleet reach Europe, this is the only fine crack ware on board. Okay, so this particular kind of ceramics, which was first identified by Mrs. Oglu in 1950s in this Michigan Gouda collection, is very good indicator for colonial encounter. It only started after the colonial period. So that is the, the pattern in sources, pretty much you would expect. That during the middle Ming period, everybody had the same, from Jing De Zhen, the general Jiangxi area. During the late Ming period, the Jing De Zhen were more exclusively used by the colonial population, and these Zhangzhou were are mostly shared by the indigenous people. So that is the general pattern I have described. So it shows a kind of a marginalized marginalization of native involvement in this global trade. So the Dutch did not, uh, so the, the Spanish did not 
develop a systematic colonial mechanism to enslave these people because their primary interest is to trade with China and other Asian partners. So the, the consequences for these native population is their access to their former Asianic trade partners have declined. So these, uh, these Zhangzhou ware are traded everywhere. Um, so in Japan, there is an exception. Jap Japanese is not being treated in this way. The, there's a lot of Zhangzhou ware in Japan. But that's not because the Europeans did that to them. They have a genuine, aesthetic appeal to Japanese. They like that kind of design. OK, so, the, so they had a big influence on Japanese art, a popular culture. And the recent revelation, my interest in recent uh, years has been what exactly happened to this episode? So formerly, 10 years ago, I would use this as the last point that I, of my study. So that's it. And then, be, then it has nothing to do with the Qing period. Why? Because there's a convenient cutoff point. For those of you familiar with Chinese history, you would know that during the, the middle 17th century, the Ming Empire fell, and Zheng Chenggong, Kaohsinga, his enterprise decided to fight for the Ming loyalists. So eventually they fell on the coast against the Manchu. So they went to Taiwan. They, they drive away the Dutch and then conquer Taiwan. And then they will resist the Manchus from the island. What happened then there is the early Qing government introduced a, a evacuation. Okay, so it's like 10 miles on the coast. Everybody has to leave, have to move inland. So they can cut the economic ties with the Kaohsinga's forces in Taiwan. That would shut down all these kilns and his coastal enterprise, right? So as a result of that, there is a shortage in the market, international market. So in Japan, the Imari kilns, Arita kilns, Imari production, thrived with Fujian technology. So clearly with Kaohsinga's uh, artisan potter's involvement. And then in Holland, you have the Delft production. So it's a kind of finance imitation of Chinese export ware. So they're all filling in that market again. So you can call it again a, a Ming Gap and overseas factories. So this would be a good cutoff point. Because once Kangxi eventually conquered Taiwan, when this is all over, he again allowed Jing Dezhen production to export. And Jing Dezhen then quickly take over all the market by imitating the Imari wares, Delft wares with the Jing Dezhen technology. So that ushers in the new era. The era pretty much fall into the art historian's world. So I thought that's a good cutoff point. But, but the, the question is, if the, these people are so adaptive, if these coastal people are so adaptive, and if this technology has been going on for several thousand years, would that enough to stop this? Or where does this great Zhangzhou tradition go? Okay, And how does this connect with the late imperial Chinese diaspora? And all of those, all the pieces you would find in Chinatown. Many are not from Jing Dezhen, again, from this area. So that leads us to this place of Huan'an. So this was recently discovered. So when I was doing all this research 10 years ago, this was not known. So these kilns are shut down. So Kaohsinga's home base is here. And then these Zhangzhou kilns in the late Ming period are over here. So it turned out with the relocation of people, they only moved up the hill. Okay, and now that's how it looked. These things look like. If you look at these kilns, just flourished after the shutdown of the Zhangzhou production, they are the same people. They're the same technology. This multi-chambered step dragon kiln. Okay, and it is these technology 
that is taking us all the way to the late imperial period, the 19th century where. Okay, so that is in Zhangzhou, that is, those two are in Pinghe, so these are the early Qing period. So the only one inland, to avoid the no man zone, and then that goes to Dehua where. Dehua, so these are where all the kitchen Qing stuff come from. Okay, all the things you can still find in the market. So here, is in Hong Kong. This is the late Ming, early Qing period. Same technology. You can see it's the Minnan potters are doing this. And then this is the Qing production in Hainan Island. So what you see is that convenient cut-off point is no longer so convenient. So that coastal evacuation did not stop this tradition, and this just goes inland and then operated parallel to this great Kangxi production, Qianlong production in Jingdezhen, and go straight into you know, 19th century Chinatown material. So that's how it looked like, so this evolution. And these are a very typical early Qing period, but look at these. So these are new revelations allow me to understand you know, how my attempt to compartmentalize the pre-European, early, early global, and then 19th century has failed. So it, it basically, I have to encourage us to look at a more comprehensive view to document this in a long array. So again, calls for new knowledge. So I will conclude here, uh, so these uh, ceramic Record serves as archaeological manifestations at the intersection of the global and the local dynamics. In many cases, especially in Drake's Bay and Baja, we're not even sure the native Indians who get hold of these wares and modify them have actually seen the Europeans. Okay, so th there are records that before they abandoned the ship in Drake's Bay, the native Indians came and got some pieces. So that is known. But these ships at the bottom of the Drake's Bay, they continually yelled every few years, these shirts on shore. So you could have a different native Indian groups pick these things up, not knowing their association with Europeans, with ships, with China, or nothing. They only see this as ocean product. So these pieces themselves are the encounter, not the human. Similarly, in Baja, that rack has been on the desert for 400 years, and 200 years ago, when the Spaniards explorers or missionaries visited that area, the native Indians actually showed them the bowls. So they actually know these areas, and they mined these, use these pieces. So that calls for a new kind of conceptual framework to document these global encounters of people who have very different perspectives of technology and materiality and art. So this continuity in ceramic technology also reveals the cultural resilience in adapting to changing circumstances in the Fujian coast in, since the 13th century onward, which means we have to then rethink how to classify, how to design our chronology how to build a long-term narrative. So my talk will end right here. I will thank many friends who helped me, especially Professor Li Jia An uh, from the uh, director, retired director of the Fujian Provincial Institute of Archaeology, who has been a great mentor for me for the last 15 years. Great, thank you. I think it, it, it means in Portuguese, ship. Ship, yeah. The crackware. You talk about the crackware. Yeah, I think now the general consensus, it came from the, the Portuguese pronounce, pronunciation of uh, ship. It just means like shipware. Uh, but the defining attributes of these 
quackware is always have these panels, and they're always very thin. And then the edges, they also have so-called a malt bite. It means they're so thin that the glaze, when they fire, it shrinks. So the glaze often is not uh, well glazed. So these are imitations. Uh, let's see, yeah, th these are more typical ones. Is there, is, there any, is there any connection between Spanish Mahalakan wear and uh, Chinese influences to Spain? Uh, yes, there are interactions. Um, I'm not an expert on that dynamics, but I can tell you what's in most interesting revelation to me. Um, from our PhD student, Alan Xie, is this one. When I saw this in Manila first time, I thought, oh my god, this is a, a, a very crude kind of an art expression uh, that probably shows the native perception of Chinese things. Uh, so basically, it's an earthenware pot with Chinese uh, porcelain shirt set inside, but sticking out. So it's not showing the reflective side, it's the side. So I thought it was almost like some kind of an indigenous art. And uh, it turned out, after my student's research, this was a, a Spanish and Portuguese tradition. So it was not a native response. So my story was like this. The earthenware used to be very powerful in Philippines. So all these caves would have these earthenware effigies for ancestors and this land. So and then in the 13th century, when the Chinese porcelain came, Chinese porcelain can ring. So that ring sound is the sound of ancestors and the gods. So it was very powerful religiously. So that basically immediately get adopted to their tradition. And also these dragon jars, mataban jars. And then that led to the native world crash. So that tradition ended. So that's the followed with the porcelain age. So when I saw this, I thought, oh, this is such a good example how native people using their earthenware to re react to the new materiality. It turned out I was totally wrong. So this is a European thing. Yeah. Thank you for the fascinating talk. Uh, I wonder if you can uh, tell us a bit more about the colonial encounter, because you mentioned how Boston was one of the, the products that was exchanged with the Navies and also with the Europeans. So what were the other products that were exchanged in the process? And, uh, and how was it was used? Was it used in the form of like a more uh, seen as a more of a superior type of food, or was it deemed as a form of more like a more like commodity than uh, the one that you mentioned that we were from Zhangzhou? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, first of all, I think uh, Dr. Xie's dissertation would provide much better answer than me. Because I have not worked on this colonial dynamics recently. See, I, you, you can see why my lecture is a little bit broken because my mind is still in, in, I'm in my 60, 600 page manuscript, which is due this week. Uh, so uh, for, I'm going through the proof. So, but the, the, the dynamics is fascinating in a way that uh, people have different views on how these wares are perceived, okay? So there was an argument that the native, for example, the, the Filipino people, the native and Filipino have no discrimination of quality. And they have a fascination of the focus stroke of these Zhangzhou wares. So, so if that's the case, that's by choice. So that's not a consequences of a, a changed colonial consequence. But I don't agree with that 
because you, if you carefully study all the way to the 14th, 13th century, you know, when you go back to the early period, the, the quality differentiation, these stuff, are the same. People can tell what is good, what's bad. And also those Zhangzhou where, yes, there are people who appreciate the folkish work. But if you compare the folkish work you find it in these um, uh, Filipino sites and the Japanese sites, you realize they're different. For the Japanese sites, they're deliberately folkish. So it's like that eccentric wabi-sabi aesthetics. For the Zhangzhou where you see a large quantity of uh, wasted pieces, things that shouldn't have leave the Kyung area. So that shows the dynamics. So previously, I'm, I'm talking in reaction to our earlier generation of Michigan graduates, their research on this collection. At that time, they couldn't tell that Zhangzhou production only started after the arrival of the Europeans. So they argue that the native chiefly competition it, through the means of a competitive feasting, generated these demand. And th because they have no quality differentiation, so all the Chinese kilns reorganized their production to mass produce these Zhangzhou wares to feed this indigenous political dynamics. And when I realized that these Zhangzhou production only took off after the arrival of Europeans, my story changed dramatically. Yeah. Made, and how that fit into your, your broader story? Um, for example, the Ming Gap, you know, the, the home where Sure. Um, to be honest, much of my picture has no imperial involvement in it, it with the exception of these ones. Because we just never see them in archaeological record. Yeah. And. Um, but in this period, you can see how, how they're doing this. During the Mongolian period, they are just mass producing this in these dragon kilns. And you see these large chargers everywhere, sold everywhere. And then when the Ming take it over, there's a, a lack of a mechanism to establish their own kilns. So they are making imperial orders to these kilns that was already in Longchen that was operating during the Mongolian period. So, but, so the, the, the glaze, you, but the glaze look slightly different. We don't know what account for it. Um, yeah, if you're interested, I will show you in the future more pictures to tell the difference. Uh, but this is a very brief episode. After that, most of the Jin production, uh, imperial production moved to Jingdezhen. That's the area I'm not so um, involved with. So with arrival of our new postdoctoral scholar here, which will be the future director of the Jingdezhen Institute of Archaeology, we expect to do more work there. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Professor Yi. Um, um, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm an engineering student instead of an uh, archaeology student, but I'm always um, interested in um, the traditional civilization. I'm wondering the characterization method that you mentioned, the, egg, um, uh, the energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence used on um, the bottom side of uh, the civil web. Well, I'm wondering that um, is it uh, was was it done on a uh, uh, the sand itself or oh the just to grind the, the, these pieces, these shirts. Yeah. I can send you uh, the paper she published. <laughs> I did not do this myself because I always felt unfair to us. I said, look, I can tell instantly what it is. What do you mean that scholars can't tell the difference so I have to use this method? But she can say, oh, yeah, there's very tiny pieces. Okay. But to, to me and my students, you know, the, these are so, the difference is very striking. But the problem is to distinguish the low quality Jingdezhen ware 
from high-quality Zhangzhou ware, that's where things get problematic. Maybe another quite naive question from me is that um, are you only considering like uh, those three sites for uh, Kyung, um, Kyung production, or is, is there any other like minor sites? Oh, uh, that's a very good question. Um, Yes, there are other minor sites. Indeed, uh, much of this production was only discovered in the 90s. So in the 50s, Mrs. Oglu, the curator of the Gouda collection, has already identified this group. So she argues that this is not Vietnamese, uh, not Thai, it has to be on South China coast. But she can't tell where. So during this time, all the Chinese archaeologists who come to our museum in Michigan, they look at this and say, no, 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 it can't be Chinese. <laughs> this is so low quality. Uh, so, because most of the leading archaeologists, they don't work on these folk kilns, okay? So they, they all work on imperial kilns and Jin Dejun. So only in the 90s is when the Japanese send their, uh, a Chinese student, uh, late Professor Xiong Haitang, he's, so the Jap his Japanese teacher sent him to search for these kilns because these kilns has a major, these products has major contribution to Japanese art. Yeah, it, it, Japanese restaurants, if you look at the pieces, they all look like this. That's why it's the Zheng Chenggong legacy. Uh, and, uh, and also many of these things has great appeal in tea uh, ceremony, aesthetics. So, from that angle, they came to Fujian and find this kiln. And then around 2000, when I started studying this Gouda collection, I was coming in from this uh, colonial angle. But so eventually, the person who find this uh, in collaboration with the Japanese is uh, Professor Li Jian at Fujian. So I met him and we became good friends. So we have been doing this for the last almost 20 years now. Thank you for a very systematic and well connected talk. And, uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, particularly, I like that the just position between the Jin Chen and the Chen Chou. Where uh, um, I know it stopped shot at the at the late main area, but uh, um, I'm more curious about uh, because for the 18th century, uh, I read some very interesting article and document about how difficult it is to move the export ware from Jin Chen all the way down to the coast. Uh -huh. And so I wonder if you come across any documentation about your area of study, but also document about the challenge or different features of uh, exporting the Jin Chen ware uh, as compared to the coastal queue. Uh, as I said, I was not so much involved in the Jin Dejun until recently, so I don't really know the challenges. Because when I see tons of this stuff everywhere, I never thought about challenges because the, these, these logistical problem has been solved since the 10th century. If you are familiar with the Balitong shipwreck, you know, that's the 9th century. Uh, the the, 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 the 60,000 pieces for Middle Eastern market was produced in Changsha. That's even further inland. And then it go all the way, follow the Yangtze to Yangzhou and then end up in uh, Java Sea. So, so these logistics uh, to the, the exporters was not a problem. Yeah. But for those familiar with local history, you know, there's a shipwreck uh, called uh, Frolic, something like that. There's a book, uh, a gift from the Celestial Empire. So it's a 19th century clipper, American ship that sunk offshore California. It has these stuff, and it also has prefabricated wooden houses for the go, uh, gold mining communities. And that book even said that one of those prefabricated houses is still in operation. Now, it's like a little court. <laughs> it's a histo historical site. But you can see that kind of IKEA, Walmart mentality all the way into 19th century. And I thought, okay, it's convenient to have this uh, coastal evacuation. I don't have to deal with them. Uh, all I need to deal with is the main stuff, you know, 
one sees the 19th century as a different kind of a scholarship, historical archaeology. Uh, unfortunately, now I realize it's not like that. <laughs> it's the same people. Yeah. Great. Thank you.